following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. joining me on Get Real this week as well, uh, our Thursday's edition. Uh, the country is slowly recovering from COVID-19, the pandemic where the world entirely has seen. We've seen a massive spike being reported even on world news you would have seen uh, in uh, the United States and certain parts of Europe as well. The numbers are not slowing down. The pandemic is not slowing down. That's what the World Health Organization is telling the world. So tonight, I, my focus is on about what Sri Lanka has been doing. If you compare the world situation and Sri Lanka situation, nobody has to tell you that we've done a tremendous job owing our many thanks, our sincere, heartfelt gratitude to our military and our health officials, the doctors, the nurses, the attendant staff, every single person who has done their job to make sure that we flatten the curve. We started flattening it long time back, um, back uh, in, in April, and we've been actually steadily keeping it. But I'm sure you've seen somewhere around uh, 6 or 7 in the night, you are getting a message, a text message from other Virana, uh, saying that apparently we found five people, we found six people. You know, there is cases being found. But what you need to understand is since April, there is no community transmission. Within the, that's why you and I have the freedom of running around wherever we want. We, yes, we need to take precautions and make sure that we safeguard ourselves and our community as well. So that is happening because of the fact that health officials, the military, and every person involved, even from the president to to you, what you as a, a member of the community doing, uh, has done a tremendous job. Now. The question comes, as reopening happens, uh, certain parts of the world are also, you know, slowly opening their borders, bringing in uh, tourists and, you know, asking people to come back into their country because the economy now needs to start reviving as well. Certain countries who are depending on tourism uh, is slowly asking everybody, like in Europe, to come. Uh, that is where now I need to go into because Europe very recently uh, released a list which they said we will start accepting tourists and travelers from those particular countries into the EU bloc. The European Union currently has 1.5 million COVID cases. Uh, out of that, around 150, uh, around 120,000 people have lost their lives. Countries like Italy, Spain, uh, the United Kingdom, even though the UK actually left um, the EU bloc, has massive numbers and not one single country within the EU bloc has numbers like Sri Lanka. But for them, Sri Lanka is not a safe country to enter into their bloc. So I put this question to the EU embassy here. Um, they directed me to the German embassy because of the fact that apparently Germany has taken the chairmanship of the uh, European Union. And what they said was, well, they're reviewing. And the other question that I posed to them is, did they do a study before coming into this decision saying that Sri Lanka will not be included in the first 15 countries that they've released? Apparently something uh, like that has not taken place. They just pick and choose whoever the country that they want. And Sri Lanka doesn't seem to, I don't know whether it's political, it's my opinion, or um, you know, financially, whether they can actually sustain tourists coming from um, tourists or whoever is wanting to visit the European bloc. There is a massive amount of people uh, from Sri Lanka who is, who is in that particular bloc. So apparently, there's a problem. 
Admiral Professor Janat Kolomage is here with me tonight uh, to discuss about this and more importantly, the success of the COVID operation here in Sri Lanka. Admiral, um, apparently we are not good enough to go to the EU. <laughs> Did you all actually uh, bring this up with the European Union Embassy here and ask them to give reasons? Because we've done a tremendous job. 2050 is the active cases right now in Sri Lanka. Uh, this might go up uh, this evening or tomorrow. You know, we know that. But the numbers that are going up are exported cases, no community transmission, because every single country who has been nominated, like if you take Australia, if you take New Zealand, have massive amount of um, uh, countries that has community transmission, even in Australia today. Mm -hmm. uh, Melbourne is going yeah. under lockdown, lockdown. Uh, you know, making sure. So country like Sri Lanka being omitted from a list like this, it kind of gives a message to the world uh, saying, hey, uh, Sri Lanka is not safe to come. Did your speak to the EU, uh, European Union uh, U Embassy here and ask them why? So in answer to your question, let me first say the question before us now is whether the worst is over or is it yet to come? I think this is a question many countries are battling. And you mentioned about some countries opening up, but at the same time we do see that they are closing up, again, closing down again. Like you take the example of Australia and a few weeks ago, New yeah. Zealand, right? They opened up too quickly without, I think, a clear strategy of what they want to achieve. And as a result, now they have to close down again. Now, on that context, I think Sri Lanka has been extremely careful. Now, for the last 63 days, we haven't had a single case of COVID-19 positive from our community. I think that speak volumes yeah. of our commitment, the commitment of the political leadership, the president, the health, the military, and basically I would say a whole of country approach, yeah, exactly. including the media. I mean, the role played by the media institutions like other Derana 24-7, it's tremendous, right? So everything combined together we have been able to keep the curve low, right? This is a J-type curve in many countries, an exponential curve, but we have never allowed that J-curve to go yeah. up. Every time it tries to go up, we hold it down. So near flat, we have been able to maintain. So 63 days, not a single case from our community. I think that's the a huge success. That's the reason we don't have curfews or no, restrictions yeah. uh, from district to district. Now that, that was lifted. Yeah, that was recently. lifted because now people are free to go about their day-to-day -day business. Of course, still, we have to take precautions. Yeah. I mean, the good habits that we enjoyed, like washing hands, mm -hmm. social distancing as much as we can, and wearing a mask when you go out, these things have to be there because we are still within the COVID or the public health emergency period, right? Although we have not had a single case of uh, COVID from our society, there are many other countries in the world that COVID ratio is going up, right? So in that sense, we were also puzzled as to why the European Union did not mention Sri Lanka as a country which is safe for people to come to Europe. And on the contrary, I don't know whether anyone really wants to go to Europe uh, <laughs> exactly at this moment. Exactly my point. Now, uh, w when they released the, uh, this list, I was just thinking, you know, I have they, like, they love the Sri Lankan people so much, they were telling, please don't come, because if you come to us, you will actually, you know, have a worsening situation. Was that yeah. the reason? I mean, like, who would really want to go on a holiday to Europe yes. from Sri Lanka? I doubt, uh, unless... You have some sense. The other other uh, good thing, the, the, I, I want to talk about uh, this issue uh, as well. The numbers that are going up on a daily basis, uh, Admiral, is um, 
exported, uh, actually imported, imported, imported. imported cases because uh, every single day we have a repatriation flight. There yes. is no other country in the world you who's are. bringing their own countrymen back into their country knowing very well that they could be positive and taking care of them. Uh, the European Union has not done a single repatriation flight like the way we are doing it and then they have the audacity to go ahead and you know um, undermine the success a country like Sri Lanka has actually achieved is baffling and and the, hap, uh, the useless press release that they put uh, uh, you know uh, um, explaining this because apparently they are like you know reviewing the case and mm -hmm. making sure that you know they will actually include this and that is actually a blow to our relations don't you think? Well, I think uh, they should have been a little more careful when naming the names, you know, yeah. the name in the countries. Uh, because the countries yeah. they named, yeah. Australia, New Zealand. There was. Back, back in, back in a, yeah. a, a, you know, a absolute uh, horrific condition right now. I, I guess it's like the European Union, one of the main income for them is tourism. So they are so keen to open the country yeah. for tourism. But it doesn't mean that you can, you know, do it in an arbitrarily manner. So on, on, honestly, we don't know the criteria upon which they decided on these things. I think our foreign ministry made a case and I think we were told that it is based on uh, reciprocity as well. You know, if we have allowed open our borders for European Union people to come, then they would consider. So that's a, another argument that they have brought. But of course, our airspace is somewhat close because yes, we do uh, carry on repatriation flights and we permit all the international organization, the diplomatic mission people to come. Yeah. We permit that. So it is not 100% closed. It is open. And as you said, no country has done the way we have done on repatriation. And yes. I'm very happy to announce as of today, from 48 different countries, exactly. 12,732 people or Sri Lankan have been repatriated, that is from uh, Africa, South Africa continent to Australia, New Zealand continent to Even the United North States. America and including all the countries. So 48 countries is quite a large number. What people here in Sri Lanka needs to understand is the fact that repatriating is a risk. That is a calculated risk. I think we've been speaking in this program, even uh, Admiral used to say uh, when he was here, uh, you know, a few, few weeks back, is the fact that this is a calculated risk. They have closed all loopholes where all these people can leak into the community of Sri Lanka. So making sure that our military, our health officials are all constantly 24-7 monitoring this. I know Dr. Pabba Palhevan, mm. uh, even when she came um, last time, she was telling, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, where would they go? Where would they go? Uh, uh, things like that. Uh, so they're on the ball. So one thing, uh, the question, I mean, it's natural. A Sri Lankan can ask this question. Why take the risk? Well, I mean, if you look at the total figure now, it's hovering around 2050. Now, out of this 2050, unfortunately, we had a Navy cluster, which yeah. went on to 947. And that was about 46% of our total. That is total. also very much controlled. But that was a identified limited cluster. Now, out of that, more than 850 cured and others are being treated, but I think they will be cured yeah, within a week or so. Asymptomatic. Asymptomatic, and within a week or so, I think that cluster will be settled for good. So that's that was a huge cluster. And then the second biggest cluster, which is growing now, is the imported mm. cluster. As of today, we have had 757 cases of imported COVID positive cases, which is roughly 37% of our total. Now we had a 46% coming from the Navy, which yeah. is taken care of, but then we have 37% from the imported cluster. So that is, a, as you said, a calculated risk. Yes, we knew, you know, when you bring people from different countries where there is COVID impacted, yeah we are likely to get that to our country. But only thing is we have detected all these people in or through our system. Now we have been learning about it. You see, when in January, when in Wuhan, China, the virus was spreading, 
on the 27th of January, since then we have been having our monitoring system at the airport. Yesterday, Wuhan uh, yeah. actually celebrated six months yeah. uh, from COVID and now they are pretty much normal. They are pretty normal. normal. But what I'm saying is we were ready, right? Of course, now we have moved quite a long distance yeah. from that particular moment where we only had uh, IR, the infrared surveillance of people. Now we are doing PCR tests at the point of entry whether it is in the airport, whether it is in the seaport, whether it is in the fishery port, we now carry out the PCR test at the point of entry. So this is not just the airport, all no. the other ports yes, that actually is. has a possibility of coming into the country yes. and being taken Because care we of. want to take care of our own people in this country, but at the same time, we want to welcome Sri Lankans back to the country. But we have to do it in a very calculated, detailed, planned manner. I mean, this is one criticism that we are having. Why don't you bring all the Sri Lankans back? But if we had done that, by now, we would have gone to a chaotic situation. This decision of, of uh, when to bring, from where to bring, and whom to bring is actually done in, in collaboration with the health ministry. Yes. Yeah, every single person who is involved in this uh, agrees prior to this yes, uh, you course. know, decision. Yes, of course, because it is not one person's decision. Of course, the president uh, is the overall uh, I mean, point on this, him. the whole thing, because he actually monitors the situation so well. He monitors the World Health Organization the worldometer and then he take feedback from all the people like the military the health the frontline workers the airport aviation all these people and then he makes certain decisions so this is actually a very calculated decision from which country of course our foreign ministry is fully involved in this uh, they have one web portal called contact Sri yeah, Lanka yeah. through that they get the information of those who want to come back to Sri Lanka and then our foreign missions are continuously updating that you see the initially contact Sri Lanka I believe they had about 50 to 60 thousand names but it is a very vibrant uh, dynamic one we did keep changing with the situation and now say if I take one example like in in the beginning many Bangladesh in in Bangladesh many Sri Lankans wanted to come back now they don't want to come back mm. because their work restarted again and last week the Maldives said by next week uh, next month 15 or rather this 15 they might try to open the resort so many people may not really want to come but you see we are taking a feedback or recommendations from the foreign ministry or through the foreign ministry directly from our mission so that we get very accurate information about people who wants to come and then we discuss with the army the health because we have to, yeah. have to do the PCR testing we have to do the quarantine we have to do the second PCR test and if one is positive, then we have to treat them. And I mentioned 757 positive cases we got from imported. We have to treat each and every one of them, right? Now, despite this, we still continue to bring in people knowing very well that there could be, of course, in many places. Now, we have introduced another rule. Please do a PCR yes. prior to your departure within 72 hours of boarding the plane. And they do it. But the funny thing is, still we detect, even if it is 100% tested negative during that PCR, we still detect some when they come to Sri Lanka. It may not be anything wrong with that particular test, but it is basically the time, you know, it's sometime two yeah, days, yeah. three days yeah. when they actually arrive. But our pro this procedure is that we do on arrival PCR before we actually send them to a quarantine center. And then this 757 is pretty much under our control and we know it. So that is because our system picks them up and we take care of them, they are Sri Lankans. So this way we have been able to continue with our influx of Sri Lankans coming back to the country. Indeed, uh, there is a lot more to discuss with regard to the repatriation pro process. Uh, there are, uh, Admiral, there are certain complaints uh, from certain countries saying that, you know, they try to get through to one of these flights and they can't. Uh, you know, I want to get your response on that as well. Uh, we'll be right back. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. You're watching Get Real. I'm in conversation with Admiral Prof. Sanjana Kurdiwira.
Welcome back everyone to Get Real. I'm in conversation with Admiral Professor Jana Kolamge with regard to the current uh, COVID situation here in Sri Lanka. Try to get an understanding exactly what we've been doing. Um, as you um, know, so far we only have around 2,050 cases and most of them are important cases. And uh, as uh, Admiral explained um, with regard to how the process is being done, uh, it's been done uh, very much calculated, um, taking a calculated risk uh, after in discussions with the military, the health officials, the president, every single person involved in this whole process. Um, I want to ask you the question uh, which I raised prior to the break. Um, there are complaints from certain parts like in, in, in European nations, once again, <laughs> people living there saying that, uh, you know, in Middle Eastern countries mm -hmm. and all those things, saying that, you know, they tried their level best to get into one of these repatriation flights and they, they were never... They, they couldn't. They, they went to the uh, contact uh, pages um, uh, uh, from the foreign ministry and they tried their level best and they're still stuck there uh, going through deplorable conditions. Mm -hmm. um, why is that, uh, Admiral? What's, what's going on there? You, I mean, the number is quite large. As of now, I believe at least 49,000 people are wanting to come back. Now, the complaint that, you know, they could not get on to one of the uh, range flights Yes, it could be true, but at the same time, we have to remember 12,732 people from 48 countries have already come here. I mean, they are also Sri Lankans. So I think we can't be really focusing me first. Uh, it's his uh, attitude, although everybody wants to come. And I think why people want to come back to Sri Lanka is because we are doing extremely yeah. well in combating and containing the coronavirus. So that's, I think, a real plus point. And practically any Sri Lankan should be able to come to his or her mother country, there is no two words about it. But only thing is uh, the other embassies, when they make a, a particular list for a flight, they have to base their decisions on certain criteria. It may be the chronological order that the person has registered in the embassy. It may be the vulnerability of a particular person in that country or it may be he is having some compassionate ground to come back to the country either he's uh, somebody expired or some uh, family uh, matter or he doesn't have a job uh, or some earning in that particular country so there are various criteria various the, the decisions the, the our ministries have to take. And I think by and large, because now you can imagine 12,732 people have come, and now out of this, 3,000 plus students. Yeah. Now that was our primary concern in the beginning. Now still, we are yet to complete the total student population. Uh, on the 10th of this month, from Belarus and Russia, the final student population will come to Sri Lanka. So that time we would have handled all the students who really wanted to come from the beginning. Now I'm not talking about the students who are finishing exams now, uh, who want to come for the winter vacation, not that, but from the beginning people who really wanted to come. So people are coming, but at the same time, the demand is much, Quite much high. more than we can comply, we can tolerate, but it is happening gradually. So now we are focusing on the countries that we have not been able to handle, like right. Ethiopia, okay. Sudan, people from Djibouti, right? And also Caribbean countries, Dominic Republic, right? And also, uh, I think, Jordan, we have not been able to send a flight to Jordan. Uh, so these are, we are focusing now on expanding these 48 countries. Admiral, uh, explain now, all these uh, repatriation flights are mostly done by Sri Lankan Airlines, which means Majority, that uh, yes. going, they're actually flying into destinations which they have not flown before. In some cases, yes. uh, Like if you take you know, Djibouti or yep. Ethiopia, we yes, don't fly yes, there. Yes. Uh, so that means there is a massive cost incurring um, uh, when you go into uh, for foreign countries, uh, foreign uh, you know airspace and actually using the airports, we have to pay. actually pay. Um, so that is being taken care of by the Sri Lankan government. Well, on, on the on the contrary, because we actually don't deal. I mean, the government cannot spend yeah. everything. If you take uh, the quarantine process, you know that quarantine process is 14 days. So, government quarantine center, government look after everything: the medicine, food, 
the utensils like rubber slippers no or toothpaste, no you know, sense. everything is given and looked after. And then PCR testing, one on arrival, the second one maybe 10 to 12 days, and 14 days later, God willing, when they leave, they are taken to their home destination or nearest home destination. All these incur huge cost. And that is completely borne by the government. So the government has made a very uh, uh, considered decision that we will not be able to do anything with the airfare. Yeah. So we have given that task to Sri Lankan. Of course, Sri Lankan has to spend money because they have to pay for fuel and the operating of daily operating cost of the aircraft and of course landing permission, then yeah. handling agencies. So they recover that money from the people who are wanting to come. On some cases, we had the people, you know, somebody donate the money, like in one flight, uh, they run a, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, the uh, Dilit, uh, 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 border, who cost of one particular flight from Dubai but that is a rare occasion but generally people pay for their flight right so what we try to do is we try to combine our cargo flights which is Sri Lankan operated cargo flights when they try to return empty we try to use that opportunity to bring back people and also we have permitted other airlines in a limited way mm -hmm. like when they are doing a mercy flight say for example uh, a flight is coming from Thailand to Sri Lanka to take Thai people back. So we say, can you bring uh, some of our monks and other people in Thailand? So we have made use of that. And now today there is a flight coming from Vietnam mm. on a similar way. So we have been very carefully looking at minimizing the cost for our people and at the same time minimizing the cost for the country. So, um, Admiral, let me ask you now, yes, uh, like you mentioned earlier, tourism for the European Union is very, very, uh, you know, a demanding uh, area because they really need that particular industry to start, uh, you know, flourishing again. It's quite similar here as well. We need our tourists uh, to come back to Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and start using our facilities here. So, what's the plan? Uh, when are we going to see? Uh, we know we, uh, initially August 1st was decided as the day that we will open our airport and our air, air space. Uh, but now that's not going to happen on August 1st. Uh, when can we expect? Well, I, I don't know whether it's not going to happen. I think still our target date is uh, 1st of August. August. Uh, of course, you know, we are like one month away from that particular date. I think the, our tourism uh, ministry and the tourist board is very keen to get people come back to Sri Lanka because you see tourism is a major industry in Sri Lanka and I mean we had a situation where it went to zero mm. I mean not a single hotel was occupied not a, a single tourism related industry was functioning and then I mean we did a good thing because the army actually took some tourist hotels as paid quarantine centers, those who could afford like 7,500 rupees yeah. full board per day. And we had taken quite a large number of hotels. I think they could survive uh, because they were getting some income. And now that is only limited yeah. to a certain uh, hotels in Nigambu and Dambulla. That's never ha ha happening in, in, in Colombo, the main hotels in, in Colombo. In Colombo, of course, we have taken Mount Lavinia Beach Hotel. And of course, then the seafarer started coming, the Ozo Hotel and uh, Fairway Hotel we have taken so they are getting some money but that's not enough yeah. I mean this tourism is a major business and it's a it's a family cottage industry yeah, yeah. so it filters down to the society so I, therefore we need to get tourists uh, tourists back so our I think the tourist department or the tourism ministry is I think trying their level best to advertise Sri Lanka as a very safe destination to travel. I think there are many people interested in traveling to Sri Lanka, uh, not necessarily to enjoy the beauty, the natural beauty, but because this is a safe place to come. So that I think tourism department is trying their best to develop uh, protocols. I think they have already done that with the combined, uh, in the connivance of the health ministry and the army and all the other stakeholders. Uh, so the idea right now is to open by about 1st of August, at least to, uh, to accept some groups to come in an organized manner, not individual tourists who actually book and come individually, but as a tour group. So they come, we have a certain protocol, certain procedures, then we uh, take them in a pre-designated route and pre-designated or pre-selected destination to begin with, right? So that is the plan. I think the marketing 
Sri Lanka as a safe destina destination Indeed. is paramount importance. Uh, perhaps you should focus on the European Union uh, to <laughs> advertise. Yeah, European <laughs> Union is one of our good markets, really. Yeah, uh, um, uh, uh, Admiral, the other question is now, okay, we start uh, opening our borders and we are getting uh, tourists to come back. Is our airport system, the tourism industry as a whole, and then our aviation system, is everyone ready? Because you can't bring them the same way you brought them pre-COVID. Yep. Uh, everything has to be changed. Like even the flights needs to be, uh, you know, you need to uh, spray the, the, mm. the uh, safe uh, solutions and all. Maybe you should clean mm. the craft and all those things. You know, special things needs to come into place. And those special things means cost is going to go high. So is the entire industry ready for this particular exercise or are we still you know we're trying to you know do a trial and error kind of situation here well I think during the last three to four months we have learned many good lessons or we have learned some very good best I mean best practices how to handle a pandemic of this nature a public health emergency that experience that knowledge and that know-how will become very handy when we really open our airspace for tourists to come. So basically, during the last three to four months, we evolved through this pandemic. Our system in our airports, in our civil aviation, our health department, PCR tests. Now we are even, I mean, setting up a PCR lab in the Katunayake airport, right? And then we have learned a lot of things and we have developed our capacities. So that capacities, I mean, those capacities can now be utilized, right? Without really uh, adding uh, another uh, a huge amount of overheads, because we already have. Yeah. We have a good mechanism in the country. We have, I mean, these quarantine centers. You see, UK started quarantine centers just yesterday, <laughs> right? But we have been having quarantine centers from 1st of February, when 34 students were brought back uh, from Wuhan, they were sent yeah. to a quarantine center developed by the army within 72 hours. Yes. So army has gathered or gained extremely valuable experiences in running quarantine centers. So health has been doing a marvelous job in testing uh, and then together contact tracing and treatment. So we can't, even when we open our airspace for tourism, we cannot take a risk to the country. We have to make sure that no one bring yeah. COVID-19 to us. So we have to have many particular issues, but I think, you see, we have the infrastructure. We have the vehicles, we have the PCR testing, we have the systems, we have the knowledge. So we don't really have to spend a lot of money to get it organized. We already have most of the thing. It's a matter of using that in order to bring our tourists back. Indeed, uh, there is a lot more to discuss as well because we are going in for an election uh, in few, uh, actually in a month's time. And uh, I want to know how exactly, how much uh, is this country ready to hold the election because that's going to be the first uh, during a pandemic season uh, and we, we really don't know how it will play out. Uh, health officials are giving recommendations, uh, Admiral and, and their team also is doing the same. So we need to understand exactly how we will uh, you know, do this. Uh, and one more thing to mention is the fact that uh, when the pandemic started, we didn't have um, foreigners coming up and giving us the expertise on how to conduct a pandemic or, you know, how to make sure that to be safeguarded in the pandemic, it's all was done by our health officials, our military. And just like Admiral said, we all have the capacity. Let's take a short commercial break. You're watching Get Real. I'm in conversation with Admiral Professor Janat Kulmge Ulbarada. to get real. I'm in conversation with Admiral Professor Janath Kolamage. With regard to the current situation uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which we 
have been and will be actually doing, um, you know, curtailing and making sure that we do a good job in keeping our countrymen safe. Uh, Admiral, we're going in for an election in a mm -hmm. month's time. Uh, we don't know how this election will be played out. The election commissioner is very concerned about the fact that even now the election uh, process has been broken into two, um, which is like we will hold the election on the 5th and results will come from the 6th. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not going to do an overnight counting of uh, mm -hmm. ballots. So this is new. This is, uh, this mm -hmm. is happening uh, for the first time in, in, in this, uh, you know, um, recent memory. So uh, is the country ready? Uh, how, how uh, the, I know that the election commission, uh, uh, commission itself held a couple of drills mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, for them to understand this new norm, uh, normality, do you think that we will be able to carry this out? Or do you think that we will see really low numbers of participants in this election? Well, it's uh, very difficult for me to predict uh, the outcome or the the, the ratio yeah. that people will really vote. But I think people are keen to vote. People are keen to elect their own government. We are a democratic country yeah. and the democratic process has to go on. So it's very critically important for Sri Lanka to have elections and elect a new parliament, a new cabinet and the country must go on. We cannot be really, uh, you know, get uh, constrained by the COVID. Yeah. Uh, now we have to overcome that period and the country's economy and the social life has to go on. So, I mean, in order to give you an answer, I, I think we are ready because, you know, we, as I mentioned a little earlier, we have been getting, acquiring a lot of knowledge about how to behave in a pandemic, which we had never done before. Yeah. And how did we do it? I mean, we have done extremely well. That is basically, it was a combined effort. I think I think we must give credit to our people yeah. because, I mean, they are educated, they are intelligent, and they took it very seriously about the social distancing, protective clothing, and hand sanitizing, and, I mean, health yes, aspect. Sir. So we must give credit to the people of Sri Lanka. People have behaved extremely well, and that is how we have succeeded. So now we have to carry this success into all our activities whether it is opening tourism, whether it is reviving our economy, whether it is reviving our agriculture or industry, and conducting an election. So I think the election commission is paying a lot of attention to the safety of people, the health safety, and I think they are seeking opinion from the health department, the military, and all stakeholders, and I have a feeling the country is ready for conducting an election, and I think we all should vote. I mean, this is yes. our future. Right. We have a right to decide about our leaders. We have the right to decide who should be our leaders. So if we do not exercise our franchise, then we are not doing justice to our country. We are not just doing justice to our system. So we must vote. Uh, we must take precautions and uh, we can do it. We have done it during the worst time. So now we are even out of that worst time, now 50, uh, 63 days without a single case in our community, but we have to behave the same way we have be behaved during the worst period of pandemic and just go and vote. Indeed, um, the, if you all are thinking, if anybody is watching and if you all are thinking that, you know, uh, Sri Lanka is the only country who is holding elections during a COVID pandemic, well, we're not. South no. Africa did uh, very like about South Korea yeah, did one. South Korea, sorry. Um, and uh, yesterday, Russia mm. uh, uh, held an election, and also Poland. And there are many countries who's going to polls, and you know, bringing back normalcy. And that that should be our goal. Not sitting at home, uh, being afraid of the pandemic. Uh, we we did that. Now we are out of it. Now the other question that I have for you, um, Admiral, is. What's the strategy forward? Like at the end of the day, yes, you like you said, we did all this and we've come out very successful. Um, what's exactly are we gonna do in reviving the economy, or reviving our industries? Because at the end of the day, even though we started here, globally, everybody is suffering. Yep. Uh, everybody is go, you know, going through a very bad situation. So how are we going to like, you know, what is the strategy there? Well, I think this COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to revisit our economic model. I'm not an economist, so my knowledge about economic is basically uh, like the common man's knowledge. But what I feel is that we were too much dependent on an import-based yeah. economy. 
not really a production-based economy. We were quite happy importing everything, including vegetables, the fruits, the fish, everything practically. I believe we were self-sufficient only in rice, tea, and coconut. Uh, even there was a time we imported coconut also. And rice. Right, and rice also. So fortunately, when COVID broke out in the month of February, we were getting a bumper crop a harvest uh, of rice. So we were quite okay uh, in that sense. So we have an opportunity to revisit our economic model. And I think that is what President and his team of experts, including Dr. P.B. Jayasundara, who is, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, who was the uh, Treasury Secretary, experience, hugely uh, vast experience on handling economic. So they are focusing on each and every segment of the economy. Right? It is not limited to the macroeconomic, even the small and medium enterprises. Right? Now, I know two days ago, there was a meeting chaired by the president to talk about these beauticians, you know, the, yeah. the salons and things like that. So they are focusing on each and every segment of the economic society, the strata. So they want to find out how to move to the, I mean, move out of the COVID and move on. What are the issues? So I think that is a very good sign. And then at the same time, I think there is a huge interest or huge attention given to agriculture. Yes. So I believe very firmly our future lies in agriculture because we, let's say we don't have many other raw materials for a large industrial base. But it doesn't mean we cannot produce things. Now, Singapore doesn't have anything. They don't have water. They don't have soil even. Everything has to be imported, even soil and water from Malaysia. But they are a big, powerful country. They produce things, right? So we can produce still things. You know, we can get uh, raw materials and add value and re uh, import, uh, export it again. But then our agriculture has a huge potential. Practically, anything grows here. Why should we import apples and orange ears and mandarin? Why can't we grow more and more mangoes, papaya and bananas and export them as well? Because I think when I say agriculture, the president is very keen on this sustainable agriculture, not just agriculture and ruin our soil by adding even more chemical fertilizer to get more crop. That's not what we want. The president is very keen on sustainable agriculture using organic farming methods and using organic fertilizer. I think there is a huge market in the world for organically produced vegetables and fruits. That's some area we need to capture. And then same with the agriculture fisheries. Now we have the ocean around us. We have so much space for inland fisheries. So we need to be self-sufficient in fish production and export our fish more and more. So these are two sectors I think the president is very keen on reviving and he is meeting when he is meeting the foreign dignitaries. This is one area we, uh, he talks about. And when one more thing, 40% of our production goes waste because we are not preserving them, we are not transporting them, we are not doing justice to the production. 40% of what we produce is actually going waste. So we have to devise various systems and we need to use technology. We used to need, uh, we used to, uh, we must use the GPS technology, the web-based application. A farmer should be able to take a photo and tell the agriculture officer, look, there is a problem like this. What are the uh, suggestions that you can give? So we need to embark upon that kind of a technologically oriented agri-based agri economy and I think that's something we need to do in the future. Indeed, uh, we are running out of time but before that I want to take a short commercial break. Uh, we'll be right back with Admiral Professor Jana Kundi. Real uh, Admiral Professor, um, we are really running out of time. Um, let's take this whole operation. I know y'all, uh, we've been talking about success. Uh, we've been talking about how exactly our military, our health official, and everybody uh, you know, involved in this entire process did their part to make sure that uh, you know, we come out of this very successfully. Uh, 
how are we going to tell this to the world? How are we going to talk about this and sharing this kind of information, the knowledge, the, the, the experience we got from this pandemic with the world? Uh, and actually, you know, telling our story uh, from our point of view. I think our deeds should speak volumes of Sri Lanka's success story. And if you ask me the main determinants of success, I would put the leadership, the political leadership, and a whole of country approach. The health, the military, the media, everyone got together and as one unit, as one people. Now this is a great harmony, right? We have proven to the world, together we can do anything. We had never experienced a pandemic in our in the history of Sri Lanka. We don't know, I mean, our generation, your generation, <laughs> we don't know anything about, right? But we rose above. Without even having any experiences, we rose above. So that is basically the leadership, the decision making, right decision at the right time, obtaining feedback, listening to expert advice, and science-based approach. But this is a health pandemic. If we did not go for a science-based approach, yes. we would not have succeeded. So these are all determinants of success. And then the whole of country approach, everyone got together, everyone supported each other. This is a, this was a tragic situation where as a country we had to overcome and we did it pretty well. So now I think this should be a case study for anyone who is interested in how to fight a pandemic. <laughs> And we have learned quite a lot of lessons and I'm sure we will be invited to many international fora, uh, forums in the future. So we have to share what we have learned the hard way because we evolve. Even before the World Health Organization gave yes. the direct directives, we were doing things, right? We were doing things. And one of the first things the president did was to appoint an action committee, not a task force, an action committee to study and make recommendation. Later on, it was converted to a task force. And there were many other task forces to address each and every segment of our economy, the diplomacy, the society, the poverty, all that was done. So this gave us an opportunity to rise above this as a country and I think we should maintain the momentum and we should maintain what we have been doing and use the hard earned knowledge and the best practices for the future success of our country. It actually, uh, that responsibility falls back to you as well. Yes, you did your part to make sure that everybody is safe. Now we need to tell our story. Perhaps use social media, uh, you know, when sharing uh, the, your thoughts on this uh, to the world, why not? Tell a little bit what we did here and also tell the world that, you know, how successful Sri Lanka has been in curtailing a pandemic, a global pandemic. The death toll right now has surpassed 500,000 people all around the world. That is tragic. That kind of fatality we've never seen in our lifetime. That has happened. But here in Sri Lanka, Touchwood, we just only, only lost 11 precious lives. Even that, if mm -hmm. we've been able to stop, we would have, our people would have done their level best. And we can guarantee that they did their level best. Admiral uh, Professor Janath Kolomke, thank you very much for coming back and actually uh, telling us the latest on the COVID operation. We will keep in touch and also have more discussions like this in order to understand how we move forward. And once again, thank you very much for coming back. That's it for today. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll be back again uh, at 9.35 with World News. See you then. Bye. For now.